Good evening, Transylvania alumni and guests. Um, I am Natasha Mangiardo, Director of Alumni Relations, and I am coming to you from Transylvania's campus. We are in our final week of our Pioneers Always virtual alumni engagement series, and it has been wonderful to see so many alumni participate and connect with one another and back with um, our alma mater. So we are in for a treat this evening um, because we are going to learn a lot about tr um, Transylvania's strategic enrollment plan and also get some great advice and tips on how to do the college search process uh, for any of your family members or neighbors and friends that might be embarking on that sometime soon. So I have with me this evening two of our admissions and enrollment experts. Sarah Cohen um, came to back to Transylvania last summer as our Vice President for Strategic Initiatives and Enrollment Management. She previously um, at Transylvania served as the Director and the Dean of Enroll Admissions from 1999 to 2006. She is um, then went on to be a consultant for Ruffalo Noel Levitz for the about 10 years and then came back to Transylvania. Uh, while she was at Ruffalo Noel Levitz, she worked with more than 150 institutions in the US and Canada, including college presidents, executive teams, and boards of trustees. Sarah, um, holds a bachelor's from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, where um, she was NCAA, NCAA Division I volleyball player and a student athlete of the year. She has a master's in public administration from Central Michigan University. She and her husband uh, live here in Lexington. He teaches at EKU and they have three children um, who I'm sure are destined for Transylvania. And then we have uh, Johnny Johnson, who is our Vice President for Admissions, has been serving in that role since June. Um, Johnny has actually been at Transylvania since um, 2011. Um, he came to Transy from Georgetown College. He um, has served in admissions roles all of his career, even when he was an undergrad. Um, he's a native of Chicago. He's a past president of Kentucky Association for College Admissions Counseling and um, really has helped Transylvania over the last uh, 10 years shape our admissions efforts. And I'm really excited to have both Sarah and jo Johnny join us this evening. So um, Sarah will present first and then Johnny, and then we'll have questions and answer session. Uh, feel free to use the Q&A box for the questions. And also, the um, I should say that this session is being recorded, so we will be able to send the link to those who could not attend this evening. Uh, feel free to throw in the questions um, into the Q&A box at any point, but we will save them for the end and we will follow up on any questions that perhaps we don't get time for. So um, without further ado, Sarah. Thank you, Natasha. So I am also going to share my screen. Um, let me do that and I'm gonna go in slide mode, but can Johnny, can you give me a thumbs up? You can see my slides, very good, thank you. So before I, maybe before I go into um, a little bit about what we're working on for strategic, um, some of the strategic initiatives and enrollment management. Just want to say it's great to be back at Transy. Um, just so you know, technically, if it looks like I'm looking two different places, um, uh, can you all, you can hear me, everyone can hear me. Um, if it looks like I'm looking two different places, it's because I am, because I'm having to use my phone and, um, and my uh, laptop, but I think, I think we're, we're doing well. So, um, it's great to be back at Transy. As Natasha said, I've been back since, um, since August, lots going on. 
And, um, you know, my role is really one where I'm working closely with Johnny. We're sort of partners in the effort to, um, to increase enrollment at Transylvania. And, and this is really about thinking about other initiatives besides all of the, you know, tons of things that Johnny and his team are working on in the admissions office. This is about thinking a little bit longer term. We know there are some demographic challenges coming, um, coming our way. So again, this is about what are some things that we might want to think sort of broader, bigger, longer term, um, again, to sort of help Transylvania uh, increase, uh, increase enrollment. So I also will add, thank you for the introduction, Natasha, and I will tell you that my oldest son, Brian, has decided to attend Transy in the fall. So that is uh, very exciting. Very happy about that. So let me give you a little bit of a sort of update of, of what's going on. I'm not going to go through all this in detail because there's a lot sort of happening. Um, but so that you're aware, we have formed a strategic enrollment council. Some of you may have heard about this already, but the strategic enrollment council has seven different subcommittees. So again, uh, these are the seven committees and, and I'm going to highlight a couple of the things in the next 10 minutes or so. Certainly, again, not going to tell you everything that's happening, um, but I think you would be very proud of your alma mater. Um, there is a lot of collaboration. The Strategic Enrollment Council is academics, admissions, athletics, student accounting, financial aid, student affairs, alumni and development. Um, I think literally probably someone from every part of campus is represented either on the council itself or in one of our seven subcommittees. And again, each subcommittee is tasked with a variety of strategies to say, what do we need to do to think more holistically and think a little bit bigger to make sure that we are prepared to meet enrollment, not only this year, but 2022, 23 and beyond. Um, and in fact, our goal is stated in the strategic uh, focus plan that's led by President Lewis is that we will return to a number close to 1150. That's a lofty goal. Uh, we were there once many years ago and the environment was much different, but nonetheless, we've set that goal for ourselves and we're gonna do everything we can uh, to try and get us uh, back to those numbers. So I think I'm gonna highlight just a couple of things for you before I turn this over to Johnny. One thing that we have been uh, focused on is, is really making sure that we're promoting the value of a Transylvania education we're talking a lot about outcomes. That is all the wonderful things that all of you on the webinar are doing. And really trying to collect a living library of alumni outcome stories. That always helps Johnny and his team if we have more information about what our graduates are doing, where they went to graduate school, where they're employed, all of those wonderful things. We also have a campaign uh, that we're starting on focusing on the value of the liberal arts trying to make sure that families really understand what does that mean? What do liberal arts mean? And why is that an important thing, especially for parents, so that they understand that employers, in fact, look for graduates who have the skill set that, that not only from their major, but coming out of all of the other classes and the other, um, you know, everything else that they learned while, that, while they were at Transy. So, You've got a screenshot here of a, of a value page, a new value page we've created on the website, a little snapshot of some things we're working on in terms of this living library of alumni outcome stories and trying to collect those. There's also a, a video of Dean Thomas sort of talking about why liberal arts. We'd be happy to share that to you and we will be starting a little bit of a video campaign on that as well. Another thing that we're working on is making sure that our website is optimized. And some of you may know about this search engine optimization and also making sure that when students come to our site, they don't leave because they don't find something they're looking for and they say, Transy must not have that. So for example, if a student comes to our academic programs page, we, we don't want them to you know, see, for example, maybe that Transy doesn't have journalism. We would rather have them type in that I'm interested in a career in journalism or my, you know, my career path is journalism and let, let us then tell you the different majors that you could, that you could decide on at Transy to ultimately get there. So just, you know, put an example here of if you said you want to be a musician, then it sort of lists out the different majors that you could pursue at Transy. Again, the goal is make sure we know students are interested 
in finding schools that have their career interest in their major. So we're trying to answer that with also without making sure they don't leave the Transylvania website because they think that there's something that we can't do when in fact we probably can. Some of you may also know that we started a new uh, portal for parents and families. So this is just a snapshot of this. Um, we already had communication that was being sent to, to parents and families uh, from the admission office, but this portal and newsletter gives us an opportunity to deliver personalized, customized uh, information to parents. Right now, this is designed for uh, parents of our incoming students. Um, we will also be, be extending this to parents of rising juniors and seniors. And as of last count, I think we had over 2,000 parents who had signed up um, to receive the newsletter, which we, which we think is, um, is a very good sign. And we're working also on uh, a more collaborative effort across the institution to make sure that we're doing everything we can to have a great parent and family experience, which we know is so important. You may, also, you may have heard that we are starting eSports this fall. Um, there's a picture of Nick Thomas. He's our new eSports coach. Uh, Johnny and I were on the search committee to find and hire Nick. Um, he is he is awesome. Um, he is a gaming veteran. He will bring a ton of experience to Transylvania, and um, he's on campus now. He's helping set up the uh, esports facility, helping you know will help, be helping us to determine what games we're playing, recruitment. He's really going to sort of help us get this initiative um, get this initiative going. We may have a few students who join us in the fall because of eSports, but likely this will impact, you know, current students will do this and then we'll likely have more enrollment lift from this uh, come next fall just because it's already a little bit late in the cycle. Um, you might also be interested to know that we are exploring some new majors. Um, I would like to make sure that you know these are not majors yet. These are not new academic programs yet, but we are exploring them. Um, we have not added a new academic program in some time. I don't know the exact, the exact number of years, um, but this is important for enrollment growth. I think if you asked Johnny, he would tell you it would be great if we had, you know, a new major to promote. And so we're doing research right now on public health, interdisciplinary data science, as well as sports administration and marketing. We're doing research to make sure that there's market demand as in there's jobs in these areas and there's also student demand and also to make sure there's not a ton of other competitors who are already offering these programs and therefore it would not make sense for Transylvania too. So our goal we hope is to launch one or two of these in the next academic year. Um, likely you know, they, they wouldn't start until the following year, but keep an eye out. We are um, working, working hard with uh, Dean Thomas and the faculty to, again, to get some of these new programs uh, going. And then finally, I think this is my last slide. Um, we're also working on um, really a very coordinated strategic communications effort. Um, this is an effort across admissions, marketing and communications, um, the president's office, myself, uh, where we're not only trying to say, you know, where are we communicating the transy message, but let's make sure we actually can articulate the Transylvania brand promise, that we can articulate the key messages. So um, working very closely with our marketing and communications team to, to make sure we understand what those messages are and that we have a, not only an external campaign, but also an internal campaign. So I'm meeting with the strategic planning committee of the board on Thursday. We're gonna start some conversations around gathering some input um, from you and from trustees on what you think Transylvania's brand promises. So this is actually one call to action I have for you. Um, you don't need to you know, speak up right now, but if you could help us and be thinking from your experience at Transy, you know, not just the key messages of, you know, yes, we're, you know, in, in downtown environment and, and great education, but can you think even a little bit bigger about if you had to, in one or two sentences, tell a prospective family about your experience at Transylvania, what would that be? What would you say? What, you know, what do you think our brand promise is? 
we're sort of collecting any any and all information on that and then trying to you know really begin to uh, promote this moving forward so we think it's important that we understand the message we communicate effectively with the right audiences and that we're communicating to those audiences through the right channels for example we are going we're looking now at more uh, digital making sure our website is is up to up to speed we still have to do print and email um, it, right now it seems like we have to communicate all in all of the ways but we also know we need to increase mobile digital you know, any of, obviously you have um, kids that age, you, you know that is in fact how they communicate. So that is a quick snapshot. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second. So that again is a very quick sort of, you know, down and dirty overview of some of the things we're working on. There are a lot of other things in terms of looking at new student populations and increasing diversity. Um, and a lot of other things that we could we could talk about, but those are, I think, some of the key highlights. And again, it's been a really collaborative effort across campus, and I'm just so happy to be back and looking forward to sharing progress with all of you um, as all this unfolds. So thank you very much. I'll obviously stick around. I'm gonna turn it over to Johnny. All right, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you all for, for being here tonight. I'm gonna do a couple things. One is just give you an update on uh, the class that's coming in. I have a, one quick slide for that. And then Natasha asked uh, that I give some information about if you have rising seniors, rising juniors, even rising sophomores um, in high school, what information I could share with you all about just making sure that you're covering all your bases and making sure that you're on the right path uh, for, for them entering uh, entering college in the next several years. So if I can share my screen now, uh, we'll go here. And then, okay, I think you all can see my screen now. So I'm gonna move forward here. Um, and just what, wanted you to know, this is as of Monday, um, we have 309 students who have committed to Transylvania. And you can see the two previous years at this same time, you know, in 2020, we're at 262. Of course, we were in the pandemic. We were really heavy into it. Um, and in 2019, we we're at 286. Um, and so again, a testament to our team and really everyone across campus uh, that's been helping with the recruitment process, making sure that we're touching, we're touching these students in, in several different uh, communication bases, like Sarah mentioned. Like we're, we're still doing print, we're still doing email, but we're texting, we're on several social media platforms, we're doing things with parents, um, and that's really helped solidify this class. We haven't been able to tour as many families on campus or have a lot of on-campus events. We've been living in a virtual space for the past year, uh, but we've still been able to share the transy message with these families. And so 309 is where we are as of, as of Monday, and we hope that number increases. We don't stop at 300. We, we, we recruit all the way through the summertime and even until they move in uh, in August. And so we'll continue working with these families because we still have a lot of students who are not committed yet. So we'll work with them. Couple quick stats under that: about 45% of this entering class are athletes. Athletes or athletics continues to be a strong connector for students. Um, if they feel like they can get a great education and participate at their sport at the D3 level, it's an awesome collaboration for them. Um, and so that's been a really, really great push for us. 18% of our students um, are students of color in this in this graduating. Excuse me, in this senior, this incoming class. Um, and that right now is the racial and ethnic uh, students of color breakdown. Actually, we award a trailblazer scholarship, not only to racial and ethnic students of color, but for religious diversity, uh, students from the LBGTQ community, students with disability. And that number is actually about 22% 
of the class. So even at 18% is, is a little bit more. And then we have 36 legacies uh, in this entering class, which is awesome. If you guys can remember a couple years ago, President John Williams instituted a $2,000 legacy scholarship, which, which could be added on top of a student's academic scholarship. And we've been really promoting that and trying to increase our legacy connections. And so many of you, again, as, as, you, as your students start to, to look at at Transylvania and other institutions, just to know that there's a legacy scholarship on top of the academic scholarships, on top of the fine arts scholarships that, uh, that, that they might enroll, or that they might um, be awarded. So with that being said, now I'm gonna jump to my prospective student hat and, and talk as if you were a prospective family and give you a couple keys and things to be thinking about as your students are going through high school and finishing up their high school careers. And I will talk to you as if you're students, but I want you to think about this as parents as well. Always tell students, know who you are. And that doesn't mean know what you wanna do for the rest of your life. It just means know what you want out of this college experience. Do you want a large institution like, let's say University of Kentucky that has 28,000 plus undergraduate students? Do you want a medium institution like an EKU or a Moorhead? Or do you want a small institution like Transylvania? That's important because it's not to slander any of those institutions, but there's a difference in the way the education is delivered um, and experienced at different institutions. And so the student needs to understand who they are and what they want um, from their institution, what kind of environment they want to surround themselves with. And I'm going to talk to you about how we do that. Um, students need to determine how close to home do they want to be or if they want to be far away. Um, you'll be surprised at how many students say, man, I can't wait to get out of the house and I want to go to California. And then they end up in Kentucky because at the end of the day, they do want to be in a place where they're comfortable and being close to home so uh, for a lot of families and a lot of students mean being, means being comfortable. And especially coming out of the pandemic when we're not sure of what the future holds, um, being close to home or being an hour to two hours or an hour to three hours away is very comfortable uh, for, for, for students. Um, I mentioned that the student doesn't need to know exactly what they wanna major in or what their academic interests uh, are gonna be in terms of being their emphasis, emphasis but they do need to know what they like and what they don't like in terms of academic programs. Um, I, you'd be surprised at how many students say they wanna do pre-med, they wanna be a doctor, but they hate science. Well, you know that doesn't work. That doesn't work together. And so we really encourage students to think about what are your interests? What do you like to do? What do you like to study? What is an interesting class that you've taken or are taking that really you could build on? Um, and, and so we talk, talk to students about that as well. And then the last thing here is starting over. I mean, a lot of students feel like they can start over. High school was a certain part of their life. College can be another part. And so what does that look like for them? Does that mean they're starting over just in a different city? Does that mean they're starting over with a different extracurricular activity? Does that mean they're starting over five hours from home? You know, those are questions that we often ask our students um, to think about as they're going through this process. Then many of your students, if they haven't already, especially if they're juniors, they're gonna, they're, they're going to get a ton of mail and email. And as, as Sarah mentioned, we continue to be, uh, to produce publications and we continue to do emails because that's really where the students are. Um, but I always ask students, do you know how you got on someone's mailing list? And many of them don't know. Um, before COVID, a lot of college fairs were happening. So students don't realize when they go to a college fair and fill out that inquiry card, that starts them on a mailing list. When they take those practice ACT and SAT exams or the real exams, colleges can buy those names and we can start sending you emails and, and, and mail that way. Um, many, of, many of the students when before COVID, they were in their guidance counselor's office and they would get an inquiry card from a college book. And they could send it in the mail, like a you know an automatic mail, um, and then it gets to the college, and then we start putting you on our mailing list. Same thing with college websites. Students are going to websites and filling out an inquiry form to get information. 
That's how students get on the mailing list. So I want you to have an idea as to why you're getting this mail. Um, I, I used to kid students all the time. It's your fault that you're getting all this email because you signed up for everything. Um, and you can always opt out or you can always tell a college you're not interested anymore. But, and that's perfectly fine. I just want people to understand why they're getting the communication they're getting, how they got on those, those different lists. And as the junior year goes through, and especially the senior year, you will start to receive more and more communications from colleges. Um, we even buy sophomore names. So we're communicating with sophomores, juniors, and seniors. I know of institutions that are buying eighth grade and freshman, first year student, uh, high school student names. So it starts early because we want to we want to be on your radar and we want to stay on your radar. That first point there, never make a college decision without visiting campus. You're gonna to get tons of mail. You're gonna be on a lot of different websites. Um, you're gonna hear from a lot of different people, but the campus visit is the thing that helps you understand what really goes on campus. The brochures, the websites, at a certain point, they all start to look alike. Um, you, you've seen those, those pictures um, and we produce a lot of those pictures. But the web, excuse me, the campus visit allows you to feel what campus is really like. It allows a student to envision them, themselves walking in and out of residence halls or walking from the library to an academic building or going to the cafeteria and smelling what's going on for lunch or going to the athletic facility and seeing the weight room. You have to visit those different campuses because they all feel different, you know. Small schools don't all feel the same. Large schools don't all feel the same. So we encourage students to get on as many college campuses as possible. Um, during the COVID time, the pandemic time, we were one of, the, one of the few colleges that were taking students in buildings. A lot of colleges were not going in and out of buildings, but we worked with our maintenance staff and our student life staff because we wanted families to really get a clear picture of what Transylvania was like. So they're gonna see a residence hall they're gonna see an academic building. They're gonna see the library. They're gonna see the dining facilities. We've got to show off that brand new campus center. So we were going in and out of buildings all during our tour with safety protocols. Make sure you're doing that as you start visiting campuses. Um, those are just a listing of things you can do, whether you're visiting classes or talking with professors and things like that. Um, this year, we did not, did not do any overnight visits. We will bring that back probably spring 2022. We won't do any overnights in the fall, but as things get more comfortable and more opened up and everyone is uh, feels better about being vaccinated and things like that, uh, we'll do some overnight visits as well. Always tell students, especially that senior year, don't take senior year off academically. College, and you all know this, college does not get easier. College gets harder. And if they take that senior year off academically and just take easy classes, they're setting themselves a year back when they get to college, no matter if they're coming to Transylvania or another institution. So I want them to continue taking the advanced placement, advanced placement courses or dual enrollment and those kind of things. I don't want them to kill themselves taking eight different advanced placement classes, but take one or two to continue to challenge themselves. I tell students, even though many institutions are test optional, to still take the ACT and SAT. Testing doesn't stop after high school. Uh, as you go into graduate school, students still need to take the GRE or the MCATs to get into med school or the LSATs to get in law school. So testing doesn't stop, even though we might not need it for admission or scholarship right now, testing is still a part of life um, in college and beyond. So I still tell students to take the test, even if you're not gonna use it. And then students should go ahead and start working on their resume now. When I say resume, I mean their listing of activities. What are they involved in in school? Are they president of an organization? Are they uh, in the band? Are they team captain? Are they working? How many hours of community service do they have? Those things play well in academic um, scholarships, but don't wait till senior year in the application to start doing it do it now. And parents, you all know what your kids have been doing because you've been driving them to everything. So help them with the freshman and sophomore year. They might've forgot about that one activity that they only did for a year. 
start the resume building now. So then as they get to the application part, they just have to add the last year or two. When this when it starts uh, getting time to apply, and just so you know, our application will open July 1, 2021 for, for, for seniors. Um, it's important that you all don't miss deadlines. Many students miss scholarships and miss admissions because they missed a deadline. And it's up to the student, up to the family to keep track of all those deadlines. As I mentioned, we are going to flood you with information and emails and dates, but tell students, tell your students, keep a spreadsheet of the five or six, and I've, I've got on here seven to 10 schools that they're interested in, and keep a spreadsheet of those deadlines because they will come up on you quicker than you think. Um, and so I, I encourage you to keep a spreadsheet electronically, or maybe put it on the fridge, put it on the refrigerator so you can see it every day. Um, it used to be that students applied to about you know, four to five to six schools. Um, but now I see most students are applying to seven to 10 schools. That's not a requirement. That's just the trends that are happening now. Um, common application is one of the applications that we use. That The Common App makes it easy for students to apply to multiple schools at once. There are about 1,500, maybe 1,700 schools in the nation that use the Common Application. Students can apply up to 10 schools with one application using Common App. And so that's why the number of schools students are applying to has increased because we've made it easier for them to apply to multiple schools. Just in the state of Kentucky, there's seven schools that use Common App. So again, they can apply to all those schools that they want to with one application. We still have our own application as well. We don't, um, we, students can use either one. It doesn't matter to us. We want them to put their best foot forward on what, whatever app they feel like they want to use. The things that are listed there are the things that you will see most schools um, ask for, high school transcripts, test scores, recommendations. Uh, there are some that still have application fees, so you'll want to check into that. Uh, but all those things are typical, um, what we call app materials that schools will ask for uh, in the application process. When you are applying, you need to find out how scholarships work as well. For Transylvania, the application for admission is also the academic scholarship application. But there are institutions that have a separate academic scholarship, scholarship application. And so you'll need to find that out um, to make sure you're, again, not missing any deadlines, uh, that you prepare for the interviews that are coming up, um, and th that you have all your ducks in a row as you apply to multiple uh, and different schools. Uh, of course, at Transylvania, we have fine art scholarships. So that requires an audition or an interview with a fine art faculty. It could be showing off a portfolio piece. Um, so again, keep track of those things. The admissions counselors at the institutions will reach out to your students all the time. Um, but the students still have to pay attention. The students still have to open up those emails. Uh, students still have to answer the phone or answer those text messages. So make sure um, that, that they are following up uh, with, with their admissions counselor at the different institutions. Real briefly about financial aid. I don't want to go too deep into it, but the, the free form, the free form is called the free application for federal student aid. The keyword is free. I tell families all the time, do not pay anyone to fill out or help you with this form. The form is free. Um, if you need help, call the admissions counselors or the financial aid offices at the institutions that you are applying to. Um, there are companies and there are individuals that you can pay to help with that form, but they usually try to guarantee you something and no one can guarantee you how much financial aid you can get. So I challenge you, don't pay for it. Use the free information that's out there. The other thing is that website, fafsa.ed.gov. There's another website that's called fafsa.com, C-O-M. It's $80 to fill out the FAFSA on that. So again, go to the free site, use it that way. The senior year, you will not fill out the FAFSA until your student's senior year. It will open up October 1st. And I always tell families to get it done by Christmas. By October, you should have already done your taxes for the year. Um, and so you will be able to just attach 
uh, or you could attach your FAFSA to the IRS website that you're filling things out on and your tax information will automatically go on the FAFSA. That way you don't have to keep any forms um, present. You'll be able to tax your information to the IRS uh, to your tax information. Uh, and again, those inf that, that information is free. Um, there's a statewide organization called KIA uh, where students, for those of you who, who are living in Kentucky, your students can learn about their keys money there. KIA can also help you with the FAFSA information. There's always extra, um, when, when, when families are talking about how am I gonna pay for college, you know, there's the scholarship that the institution offers, there's state and federal aid that you get for qualifying uh, by the filling out the FAFSA. There are loans that are part of the process. Work study is there for students that wanna work on campus. And then I always encourage students to look for outside scholarships uh, and those different websites. And I know Natasha is gonna uh, share this information with you all, but those different websites are some of the key areas where students can look for outside scholarships. P places where you might not always think about, but you should check. Um, a lot of, uh, of employment, your, your HR offices at your jobs could potentially have scholarships for students. Churches and community organizations might have a scholarship listing. There are government organizations that have scholarships. Government is not always about taking money. Sometimes they do want to give. Um, and so there's some government organizations that will give uh, scholarship opportunities. And really those last three points don't forget deadlines, don't miss deadlines. Um, and students need to take ownership of this process. Parents, and I, I tell parents a lot, you know, you can encourage students, you can strongly suggest for students, you can make sure they get it done, but make sure the student owns it uh, because the student is the one that's going to college, not the parent. And so we wanna make sure they understand this process as much as you do uh, because they need to make, because when they get to college, mom and dad aren't there anymore, right? They, they're a phone call away, they're a text away, but the student is, is taking ownership of all this information. And with that, um, I think I will unshare my screen now, but thank you for listening to me. Natasha, I think you're going to take over um, and do some question and answer. Yes, thank you both so much for the presentation and we have had some questions coming in the chat so I will scroll to the top and um, Sarah the first question that came in um, is for you um, it's from uh, Jeff Brinkman class of 2001 that I think you remember because he used to work in the admissions office as an admissions assistant um, so he's he said he's thrilled you're back at Transy. Um so there have been several studies and many articles about the decrease in birth rate overall in the United States. How does this trend factor into long-term strategies for admissions and um, enrollment recruitment? Is there... I think it was my feedback. Can you hear, Can you hear me, Natasha? Um, I think, yes, I think you need to do your phone. There you go, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, sorry, I, I was forgetting which one to mute and unmute. So yeah, I mean, that is a, is okay. a great question. And, and Jeff, um, thank you for the question. And it is great to be back and I absolutely remember you. So um, again, thanks for um, joining tonight. Um, it's a great question. And honestly, I think part, part of the reason why we're um, taking such a collaborative approach to try and grow enrollment at Transy because we know this, so what you're speaking about is this, what's called the demographic cliff. Um, and it basically is because of birth rates, right? So it's, we know that in 2025, there will be a decline in high school graduates. And that's not something that, you know, in, in my current, my previous role, I traveled to a lot of different colleges and I would tell colleges this, and a lot of colleges would listen to it and then just go about doing their normal thing because for some reason they thought this did not apply to them. It does apply to us. They're, the numbers will decline. The numbers will decline in Kentucky. So if you think about it, you know, it's really we're in this sort of zero sum game or we will be moving forward. So 
if we kept our market share at whatever percentage it is, but the market is smaller, enrollment will decline. So basically what we're trying to say is, okay, well, how do we combat that? What sort of new student populations do we need to go after? What new academic programs uh, do we need to go after? What sort of pricing strategy do we need to look at? So that's why, again, this is a pretty collaborative approach to try and leave no stone unturned so that when that happens to us in 2024 or 25, we're ready for it and we're not sort of sitting here going, oh, yikes, enrollment is now taking a dip and we weren't prepared. So we're trying to be uh, proactive. So hopefully that answered your question, Jeff. Thank you, Sarah. I'm gonna turn it over a little bit to Johnny. Um, the next question had to do with obviously our scholarships. Um, someone, uh, John Barrett, who's class of 70, I, I know he, he has a grandson that's um, starting this whole process and is hopefully in, gonna be interested in Transy. But um, the William T. Young scholarship, he would like to know if that is still available, and then if there's a um, list of scholarships somewhere, perhaps on our website that you could point them to. Sure, sure. We um, and thank you for the question. We still do award the William T. Young Scholarship. It is now combined with what we call our Premier Scholarship Program, and so the William T. Young is still a full tuition uh, scholarship. Below that, though, we've added two more. There's a Keenan scholarship and a trustee scholarship. Um, the, the competition for the top students in application pools has increased, um, not only at the private institutions, but the public institutions like UK and Western and EKU. I mean, they're, they're, we're all going after that small group of students. So we're trying our best to be as competitive as possible. There's an interview process with the William T. Young Scholarship and the Premier Program. And there's a listing of all of our academic scholarships as well as the fine arts on the admissions page. So if you go to transy.edu, click admissions, you'll see um, a, a scholarship and cost and aid tab there. And you'll be able to see all of the listings and the requirements for our scholarships. Thank you, Johnny. We had a question um, about college classes um, being offered through the high school and um, if through the community colleges, sorry, um, and if those credits transfer to transy or what what is your thought? I actually talked to a classmate of mine the other day about um, about her um, child, you know, taking lots of do I guess dual credit is that what they're called? Correct. Um, classes. So um, how how do you think that plays into the whole college admissions process? Well, it's growing. There are a number of students who come in to Transy with seven, eight, nine, ten classes of credit because they're taking dual enrollment, not only the senior year, but even some take the junior year. So those credits do count um, as long as our the students come in and earn a C or above with those classes. Um, and so if you have students who are doing that now, they need to get a C or above. We will need those official transcripts from those colleges. They can't be on the high school transcripts. They need to be college transcripts. And then our registrar's office will determine how they transfer in. Will they come in as a general education curriculum course? Will they count towards a major or a minor? Or will they be as an elective? But those do count. We want to give students credit for what they're taking. And of course, those courses aren't free. So you want to get credit for that for those courses because you, you're, you're spending your money on it and your time on it. But those credits do count. Thank you. Um, back to Sarah. Um, Sarah, can you explain a little more about the second possible major that you this, or you talked about, you mentioned, um, it was the interconnected data science. Um, Carla Whaley would like to know that. Yeah, so we, um, so we did some research on um, an interdisciplinary data science major. So basically, you know, we have computer science, but this is really more about um, not just computer science, but data analytics and also making sure that it's, you're not only taking computer science courses or, or the analytics courses, but you've got all of the other liberal arts courses in there. There would be some business, some economics, 
Um, it's really one of the, you know, we see a lot of schools adding a major like this. So we're trying to say what would a major like that look like at Transy so it still is, it fits in with our mission. Um, and we actually, we do have a, a study that was sent to us on, on that program. So if that's something, Natasha, you'd like me to share, I could. It, it gives more information about sort of, you know, what the courses would be, what other schools are offering it, what are some of the jobs that you can get in that area, but it's, it's absolutely one of the fastest rising careers. And so we thought it made sense uh, for us to offer it at Transy. Sure, you can always send it to me. I'd be happy to keep it. So we get inquiries I can forward on. So but thank you, Sarah. Um, we've had a couple questions come in um, kind of along the lines of, you know, we've had, uh, we've, we're still living through a pandemic and um, uh, lots of students have done the virtual schooling. So the question is, um, uh, any suggestions for mitigating a GPA dip that occur occurred during COVID virtual schooling? And then kind of pigging back on that, um, how much weight is often placed on the GPA and how will GPA and other factors be considered after this past year? That's a that's an interesting question. Uh, interesting question. Um, this year, we just saw less people taking the ACT and SAT. The GPAs really didn't take a dip. And um, Sarah and I, and I were on a call with one of our vendors, and our GPA average is about a three point seven seven for this this entering class. So it actually went up a tick, uh, which we're very excited about. The, the, um, the students seem to be able to handle the pandemic pretty well that we can tell right now. Um, will that have an effect moving forward? It remains to be seen. What we tried to do this year uh, was talk to the, especially the majority of schools that we worked with um, and learn how they distributed grades. Because there were some students or some schools that did pass fail for the end of those students junior year because it was just half of a semester left. And in their senior year, they went back to a traditional grading cycle. So I imagine we'll, we'll uh, talk to those schools again and kind of see where they are in terms of their cycle. Um, in terms of how much weight is being put on the GPA, there's more weight put on a GPA for us than a test score. Um, just because of four years of high school tell us a lot more about a student's preparation for college than that ACT test. It doesn't hurt them to do well on the test. I always tell students that I need you to do well if you're going to take it. But four years of high school tell me a lot, a lot more because it, I can see your transcripts. I can tell the type of classes you're taking. I can tell how um, challenging those classes are based on your school profile. Um, and so again, it's it's going to be a year to year over this next maybe next two years to see how students are coming out of it um, as the schools kind of go back to some normalcy. Um, but again, our GPA for the average for this year went up a tick to about 3.77, which is awesome. And then Natasha, Pete, Natasha. Back on to that. Oh, Sarah, were you going to say yeah, something? I was going to add something to that. So um, this, I think this may relate a little bit to your question, but, you know, there have been conversations internally at Transy, not so much maybe on the admissions, as, as we're looking at the admissions part of it, but once students get to Transy, so there is conversation in academics around, will our incoming students have some, you know, will they be in some way less or differently prepared given the year they just had in high school? Um, and so just so you know that there's a lot of really good conversations going on around, you know, what might we need to offer? What do we have to do? Even if the GPA didn't suffer, you know, if you've been virtual for almost a year and you weren't used to that, there's probably something different about your educational experience in high school than we've ever seen sort of come into colleges. So it's a conversation happening at Transy and other colleges um, as well to make sure because we want to make sure students are successful and they're not set up to, you know, to not succeed. So picking back on those um, questions. Um, there's a question too about um, re maybe a recommendation. Um, is there a recommendation that in-state students take advantage of repeating the grade that was taken during the pandemic? 
and would then um, the extra year be a discredit on a transcript to the in the admissions process. Whoever wants to take that, <laughs> Johnny, do you want to? Yeah, I'll, I'll start, start with this here. You could jump in uh, if if, if uh, you want to add some more. I I had a family actually ask me that a couple of weeks ago, and my my answer to them was, "What are you gaining if you're going back?" And for example, these students had already been admitted and got a pretty good scholarship. Well, if you go back to high school for another year and your GPA suffers, we have to consider that. And that could mean your scholarship changes. And so I, the, the challenge is what are you gaining if you go back? The, the, the probably most, um, the things I've heard are, are a couple of athletes that wanna go back to increase their chances for an athletic scholarship, football or basketball or something like that. But as academic, unless you think you need that extra year, like Sarah mentioned, to maybe be a little bit more social in your classes, to gain some more of that um, availability, I think, especially at a school like Transy, where we are small enough and can pay attention to all of our students in a way that a UK cannot, I think it would be better for the student to come on and continue to go to go to college. Um, and again, the social aspect is going to be the different part. If you were, if that student was virtual all year, there is going to be a transition um, and maybe a little bit of a difficulty there to get associated again in a classroom setting. But if that student is academically prepared and we can see that from the transcript, I would encourage them to keep going um, in high school. Is there anything else you want to add to that? Or I think the only thing I would add is it's my understanding that if you repeat the year, you're basically, you have to repeat the year exactly as you had it. And I might be not 100% right on that, but I thought I read that. So um, I, my, I have a, my youngest son is a freshman in high school and he's a very good student, but he thought about it because he said, I don't just didn't have a very good, I didn't meet a whole lot of people because, you know, I was virtual. And as he looked at it, he realized he would be taking the exact same courses. And I think he ultimately just decided, I don't know how that's ultimately going to benefit me. It wasn't like you could take something different or more exciting or, so I think it just would require some individual conversations with your high school. I would talk to any admissions counselors. If you're already, you know, if, if you, if you already are considering some schools, talk to, you know, one of someone on Johnny's team, I think maybe sort of talking through, as Johnny said, why would you do it? Mm -hmm. What are the benefits to you of doing it? And is it, do the benefits outweigh um, the disadvantages of potentially doing that? And I, I would also, by the way, talk to your coach and maybe talk to the coach of the school you're thinking about going to, because another year playing does not always benefit you. It depends on the roster at the college where you're, you want to go, because if, you know, just it all depends on who's on the roster. <laughs> Says Johnny and I, two college athletes. <laughs> Great point. That's right. If you got a spot, take, don't let somebody else take your spot. <laughs> and then the other part, I'm not going back my senior year to take another year of trigonometry. I'm just not going to do it. So I'm, I'll take some calculus in college. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a question from Sabrina Kimbrough Rumford, um, who also helped in the admissions office when she was a student. Um, does Trancy have services or a specific program that supports students with learning differences? Johnny, would you like to start with that? Yeah, so the main, again, one of the great things about Transylvania is that we're a small campus and we can meet the needs of our students individually and not as a big mass group. And so Dr. Amber Morgan, who was kind of the head of, uh, you know, kind of the counseling office and, do, and works with students who have learning difficulties, um, she will meet with those students and their families if it needs to be uh, individually uh, to learn about the accommodations that are needed. And then she will serve as a liaison between the student and the faculty members that that student is gonna be uh, in classes with uh, throughout that semester. And she'll do it each semester. And so if the student needs you know, to take some tests untimed, or if they need to have the lectures recorded, or if they need a note taker, 
or if there's some other accommodation, there's a tutor that needs to be assigned. Dr. Morgan and the faculty members of the classes that the student is taking will devise that plan. Some students will come to us with their ILP, their individual learning plan. And then Dr. Morgan will take assess that and make sure that we're making the accommodations that their, their personal doctor, their personal uh, doctor has, has designed for them. Um, so again, the beauty of transit, we're small campus. We can work with those students individually. No one has to know. It's a private conversation between the student and Dr. Morgan, and she, she uh, serves as the liaison between the two. And Natasha, Sarah, would you like to add? Yeah, I think I would just add to that that um, we have had more. Uh, I think we maybe I shouldn't say more questions because I wasn't here last year, but it seems there has been growing interest in you know can Transylvania serve more students with learning differences. So that is another area that we're actually exploring to say, could we do that? And if we if we did serve more students, what other services would we need? Because um, Amber, you know, if there's if we have 30 more students, she's a person of one. We just need to make sure that we would have we would not want to do that and not have the resources. But that is another sort of area that um, that we're looking at exploring to say, could we serve more students with learning differences and actually serve them and support them well? Right, and I do want to get some clarification on um, a question that came in, just I guess to clarify um, some of the questions when we were talking about the the effect of the pandemic on the GPA. Um, have to a lot of them were geared to the students who will be applying for next year. So this um, uh, alum has asked, you know, what if they're applying in the next year or two? Um, is it possible that some of those answers um, to repeating a year, pulling up a GPA would be different for that group? Any ideas, Johnny? Well, I would, I would say yes. I mean, the governor for repeating a year only did that for this year. And unless there's a call for to do that again, I don't imagine that happening for fall 2022 or 23. Um, and I think Again, we're all assuming, right, that everything is kind of going back to some normalcy. And so we expect students to be in their classes, you know, uh, on a day to day basis. Now, what it doesn't mean, it, it doesn't mean that the last two years won't have an effect on these students who are getting who are rising seniors. And so we still will have to look at those things and and make sure that we're paying attention and being sensitive to that. Um, as, as we recruit and enroll those, those students. But I think what we're talking about right now is this entering class and how that's gonna, and, and what this means for next year's class. Two years from now, I, I don't think you'll have these same questions. And I, I would add also, Natasha, if I could, I think if there's, if there's, you know, if there's someone that you have an individual question about your son or daughter, just remember to, you know, admissions offices, transi, other admissions offices, there are admissions counselors, obviously, if it's a smaller school. Um, and of course, no one does better than transi. But if you need, you know, some of these questions are really good to do individually, just to ask, like, here's my individual situation, what do you advise? I think you'll, I think you'll just get really good and helpful information from the admissions counselor who's who works in that territory. So I would advise you to do that as well. A <clears throat> um, couple of quick things. Um, can our students still participate in the UK marching band? Is that a still a I don't I don't think that's a thing anymore. You don't think so. Okay. I, yeah, I don't think that's a thing anymore. Um, I know that was something even when I first got here 10 years ago, that that was kind of being um, not as not as popular. And I don't think that's a thing anymore. Thank you. And um, also uh, legacy, you know, we talked about legacy scholarship. Um, there was a question about do legacies have an advantage in admission? And I know that there that's a no. <laughs> I even know that. So um, we love legacies, but um, they they are treated the same way as um, when it comes to being admitted. 
Correct. And um, there was also a question, is there a substantial cost difference for out-of-state students? And we don't have a difference in cost, right? Okay. Correct. I know people ask that question um, because public schools have a difference between sure. in-state and out-of-state, but private schools, one cost. Okay, and can you tell a little bit, just to touch on a little bit about, you know, um, some of the alumni here remember when we had the Career Development Center and they helped with the resumes, and I know that has involved, evolved at Transylvania into our CAPE Center, and so um, if you could tell a little bit about just what that holistic approach is to um, students' enrichment and career preparation. Yeah, I mean, real quick, um, the, the transit experience is not just in the classroom. The transit experience is all inclusive. So in the classroom, in the residence hall, in the dining facilities, in the Lexington community, their internships, all those things. And our job, I think, is to make sure the students are getting the best advantage out of all of those things to prepare them for life after college. So they're going to get the best education in their classroom and their professors are going to work with them, but then Tracy Dunn and, and, and the CAPE office is going to help them get connected to a mentor, right? And the mentor is going to be a, a person that they can talk to about their career options within that academic field. They can also connect them to an internship or shadowship. Um, their professor is going to help them get into graduate school, not only because of the education they're getting with, from their professor, but their professor is going to write them a recommendation letter. Um, their coaches are going to help them kind of develop the full self um, because physically they're going to be active every day. But those coaches also serve as mentors to those students who are active in our athletic uh, athletic team. So that whole experience of being a small liberal arts residential school is built for the entire student, not just one part. Um, and honestly, as a salesman for Transylvania, I sell that to families uh, versus going to UK. Uh, because at UK, you're not getting that full experience like you're getting at Transylvania. Um, and so it's the, all those things. We try to connect those things the whole time. Um, the last point is the networking. I talked about the mentorship. You all know this. You've got to have the credentials. You've got to have a degree that says, I have the knowledge. But you also have to know people. And you got to have somebody to vouch for you to say, yes, I, this education that this individual got is worth you giving them an opportunity to get this job. And so that networking and the mentorship is a big part of Transylvania. Um, and that mentorship is, is key to that. Thank you. Well, we we went through all of the questions and it's 801. So um, we are at the end of our hour. I really appreciate both Sarah and Johnny, you being with me this evening, and, and I appreciate all of you alumni and guests that joined us, and we will have this um, session recording available for those who could not attend, and we'll send it to you all so that you can share with your family members too, and um, please feel free to email alumni at trainz.edu if you have follow-up questions, and I'll make sure that um, either Sarah or Johnny or someone else at the university can can help you. But thank you all so much. And Sarah, again, thank you. And Johnny, really appreciate it. Thank you all.